All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manthe Singh, uh, and I'm really excited today to talk about a new uh, parallel RT motion planning algorithm that our team has developed with you all today. Um, so I think it always helps to first kind of motivate, like, what is our goal with robotic motion planning? And at the very crux of the problem, you know, given two points, A and B, if we want the robot to be able to navigate between these two points, they need to be able to um, plan for motion. And they, these need to be you know, efficient, uh, valid, collision-free, such that we can reach the end goal safely. So in recent years, robotics has exploded in every industry. We see them in um, surgical robotics, like the Da Vinci robot. We see them in self-driving cars like Tesla. Uh, autonomous drones like you know, DJI's new photography drones and even the Roomba vacuum robot. And in all of these applications, um, robots need to plan for movement and that's why robotic motion planning has become a really important concept. So uh, Amazon re recently have a new uh, commercial household robot called Astro. I think it's really cute. I kind of wanted to add it in just to show how rapidly this field is growing and developing. But robotic motion planning has a lot of challenges the real world is difficult. For humans, it's, it's easy to, for us to navigate obstacles, uh, but you can see in the extreme left and right panel, um, you know, sudden change in the environment can cause like a Tesla to crash or a, you know, a drone to get stuck in a tree. Um, in the middle panel, you can see the Atlas humanoid robot. Uh, it's really complicated to plan because it has many degrees of freedom and uh, it's really hard to keep it balanced. Uh, even the Roomba, you know, very quintessentially gets stuck in a corner of the room and stays there for hours on end because uh, it cannot compute new valid motion paths uh, quickly enough. And um, you have failures from hardware, software, sensors, optics. There's a lot of reasons um, where robotic motion planning can fail, but in all the cases, planning for good motion is a really important concept. So our idea is we want robots to reach a goal, but we also want them to avoid hitting obstacles. So, and that's kind of where this idea of robotic motion planning really comes to the forefront. This is kind of a quintessential example of what happens um, when a robot kind of sees an environment and has to plan for motion. So, robotic motion plannings come in uh, a wide variety of flavors. We're going to kind of focus for today on like the sampling based motion planning algorithm. And the landmark example is the probabilistic roadmap uh, motion planning algorithm developed in 96 uh, by Dr. Lydia Kovaraki, who happens to be uh, my PI in this project. Um, and the way it works is kind of in a two-step process. The first step is sampling. So the robot's going to pick a lot of nodes in, a, in, a, in um, the search space. And if they're not in collision with any obstacles, it kind of adds them to the map. And once you kind of develop this roadmap, it kind of gives you an idea of the connectivity of the, the space you're dealing with. The second step is the query phase. So once you've built the roadmap, if you give it a start point and a goal point, it kind of uh, attempts to build a a path that uses the roadmap to get from you know, the start of the goal point. And the great thing about this algorithm is that once you've built the roadmap once, you can keep giving it different start and goal points. It reuses the, the same planner each time to find uh, new paths. So for this talk, we're going to focus on a tree-based variant called the RRT algorithm. And what it does, it, it grows a tree from different parts of the search space independently. So if you look at the um, top panel, um, it'll start to grow out uh, edges from the start point and kind of search the search space and eventually will stop once the tree reaches the goal point. At that point, it'll kind of backtrack and give you a path through the search space. And the RT, um, one of its strengths is that unlike the PRM, it can uh, find a valid solution within a single pass. It doesn't need to build a search space before and then find a, a path through it. It kind of builds it on demand in a single pass. Um, and more importantly, the RT algorithm works really well in a kinodynamic setting, which makes it really attractive to use in commercial and industrial purposes. But before that, I kind of wanted to uh, describe what exactly is a kinodynamic problem. And, and to do this, I kind of really um, like to give this example. So who here likes to apparel park? Okay, one person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, apparel parking is difficult. You know, like, we wish we could, you know, like, bring our car up to the parking spot, twist our wheels 90 degrees and slide our car in. That would have been really optimal and you know, efficient very, uh, and makes parallel parking very easy. But unfortunately what happens is that we're constrained by the robot's dynamics. You know, the wheels can't turn 90 degrees. And this is exactly what kinodynamic problems are. It's where we're not only constrained with the, 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 the task at hand, but also by the constraints of the robot and the way it moves, how fast it turns and other such, um, like for example, you know, acceleration and torque as well. 
So, you know, like marotic motion planning algorithms have shown, you know, success in, in theoretical contexts, but how do we make it more amenable to be used in production? We're still seeing time and time again Teslas crashing and, and, and drones still getting stuck in trees. And the main idea is that we want to in, uh, increase the speed of these uh, algorithms. They're fast, but we want them to become faster, give them more time to be able to uh, calculate a valid collision-free path and try to, you know, um, you know, avoid crashing. That's always a, a very good thing for robots to do. They can just bring the human um, in a safe manner and also increases the trust in it. So our objective is to make this al RT algorithm run faster. Um, and the way we're going to do that is um, running them in parallel. So to give you a more visual example of how the RT algorithm works, there's kind of two distinct steps. So if you have you know, your uh, tree being grown and there's an obstacle, first you'll randomly sample a point. Uh, this is like, uh, and then you kind of draw an edge between them. And you're gonna check, you know, is the edge in collision with an obstacle? And if it isn't, you're gonna randomly propagate a new point and put them in an edge, and that becomes part of your tree now. Uh, in some situations, you're gonna see a collision. So you're gonna, you know, propagate a random point. You try to draw a line through them to create this edge, and then you have to check, is my edge in uh, collision with an obstacle? And if it is, you know, we're not gonna add it because that might lead to uh, an accident. So those are the two kind of most important steps. It's the edge creation and collision uh, detecting process that we want to attempt to parallelize, but it's not without its challenges. Um, the RT algorithm was initially uh, programmed to run sequentially on a single thread. As a result, a lot of the steps in them are not amenable to be run in parallel, and care had to be taken to figure out which steps exactly could we run in parallel while keeping the algorithm safe and efficient and also allowing us to cal uh, calculate collision-free paths. So that's exactly where this idea of parallel computation comes in. Um, we kind of detected that the edge creation and the uh, collision checking processes could be run independently across multiple threads. And uh, we try to use parallel work sharing con construct to kind of divide up this load and try to hopefully make them run faster. So the way this works in a parallel setting is that, again, so we, instead of you know, uh, propagating one random point, we might propagate three at the same time. We, again, we'll build an edge see if they're in collision, and if not, we're gonna add new nodes to the tree, and uh, that's kind of how we can grow the tree at a much faster rate while still maintaining the integrity of the solution. So our approach uh, to go into a bit of a specifics is that we use the OpenMP library in C++ to spawn multiple threads, and we ran the edge cr uh, creation and collision tracking process on each of these threads and try to grow out the tree pa in parallel. And uh, as mentioned before, we identify the bottleneck areas of the code, which is, again, edge creation, collision checking, and that's the uh, piece of the code that we want to run in parallel. So to test this, we had a, you know, a 2D um, autonomous car in an environment. Uh, here's its state control and dynamics, just for your information. And we tested them in two distinct environments. We tested in an environment with no obstacles and an environment with obstacles. And we were specifically looking for two metrics the time taken to find a valid collision-free path, and secondly, the number of edges we added to the tree per unit time. The second metric gives us a good idea of the efficiency of this algorithm, because if you can grow the tree faster per unit time, it usually leads to a, a valid path. So in the, oops, the formatting is a bit off, but in the first uh, benchmark, in the obstacle-free environment, uh, as we see, increasing the number of threads from one to three actually decreases the amount of time we took to find the path which is a good indication that the robot was able to find valid paths faster given more threads. And it was also an indication that our approach of uh, sharing these different uh, bottleneck regions of code across multiple threads were working as expected. Uh, the second benchmark is the uh, number of edges we added the tree per unit time. And similarly, as we increase the number of threads used, the number of edges we added the tree per unit time also grew, which is, uh, reflects increased effic efficiency of our algorithm. We then tested this uh, in an environment with obstacles, and the top um, right image shows what our obstacles look like, and the bottom image showed a candidate solution of what the, a path the robot could take. And we ran this uh, 50 times, and we kind of randomized the start and goal point each time. And similarly to the environment without obstacles, we're seeing a decrease in the number of time, amount of time it took to find a valid path as we increase the number of threads, as well as an increase in the number of edges we added to the tree per unit time so again, it reflects uh, increased efficiency both in an environment with and without obstacles. So in conclusion, what have we shown? 
So we're constantly pushing the boundaries of robotic motion planning. As robots are getting more and more complex, they're demanding for faster um, paths, as well as um, reducing the amount of time it takes for them to detect an obstacle and find a new collision-free path. So we're co constantly improving the efficiency of al these algorithms and making them more amenable to be used in, in production and real-world settings. Thank you. So we feel that um, the diminishing returns could come from uh, several aspects. Um, we could um, add, adding more edges to the, to the tree while it's a good indicator of efficiency. Sometimes those edges you know, are not, don't go into use. And so we're kind of spending this, uh, this uh, time and, and across multiple threads to create these edges. And once it finds a valid path, only a subset of these edges um, are returned. So that could be one example. Um, another reason for diminish, uh, diminishing returns is that there are other bottleneck errors to the code. For example, um, when you're trying to find the nearest neighbor, um, and these are not amenable to be run in production. So while we keep giving them more and more threads, um, there are certain aspects of the code which are we have to run sequentially. So um, we're not going to see uh, you know like when we have three threads three times speed up because there are other areas of the code that have to run sequentially. So there are a couple of factors we're still kind of investigating uh, where else can we kind of unlock more speed and, and kind of have better improvements, but that's a great question. I have a question. Yeah, so for your first question about optimization, um, one of the interesting kind of side effects we noted as we uh, gave it more edges and more uh, threads is that this idea of like the Voronoi bias so as you give it more and more threads, it starts to wander around the search space more rather than have a targeted approach. So while this kind of slowed down the um, search process, what we found is that the eventual path was actually shorter. So there's kind of a trade-off between whether we want the solution to return a path faster or kind of take its time to explore the search space better. Because as you, as you notice, the tree uh, growing in parallel kind of is more spread out compared to the sequential way. So when it's spread out, it has more of a likelihood to find a shortest path but at the cost of you know, increasing potentially the amount of time taken. So that's always a trade-off we're trying to investigate further to find a, a nice balance between the two. Um, for you, sorry, could you repeat the second question? So, so far for the RRT uh, motion planning algorithm, we focus our work on, on 2D settings, so that's something that could be in a, a future uh, works, yeah. Uh, 